We traditionally associate concern for the environment, the acknowledgement that climate change is real and driven by human activity, and really the idea that this is something that ought to be resolved in some fashion with either liberals who generally pay lip service to it and just make the right noises or leftists who, you know, I would suggest actually offer real solutions to the problem. And while those groups aren't immune from some of the things that I'll be talking about in this video, which we will see, there is a particular flavor of environmentalism or environmental concern that's become more prominent as the general public begins to notice things like it being 39 degrees in Britain or those hunger stones in Central Europe that were used to mark low levels in rivers that didn't exactly lead to good things. I guess that's why they're called hunger stones and not something like we're gonna have a huge party stones. Little, little guess on my part. This flavor of environmentalism can go by many names, but the name I want to use for it today is ecofascism. Now, this is a term that's been deployed in a lot of different ways. For example, a dipshit right winger might use the term to describe people suggesting they recycle or that growth and increased consumption in the global north may not necessarily be compatible with a planet that's, you know, livable for people. And just to be absolutely clear, somewhere on the screen, probably over my face, there will be a handy map for you all describing what I mean by the global north. Are we clear? Good. But ecofascism has a lot of components, and the gimmick of this video is that I've come up with a drink that I'm going to call ecofascism, and to be honest with you all, uh, I've just got into doing gimmicky videos since the uh, main character video, but the idea is, one, it's a handy metaphor for it all, and two, I'm going to be able to get rid of some ingredients that are cluttering up my flat because there are a lot of bottles of a lot of random things in my flat. This is going to be a neat way to illustrate how indulging these people, even the ones who pretend to hide it or whatever, and engaging in the policies they advocate for, which we already are in some cases, is going to unleash a wave of cruelty while not actually solving the fundamental problem or adapting in a just way to the issues that climate change will unleash. Uh, also, if you'd like to learn more about climate change, I did do another video about it uh, a while ago, which you can check out, I don't know, where it's going to appear, in one of the places. Otherwise, everyone, let's get started. The Situation Alright, welcome to my bedroom. Bedroom reveal, it's, uh, it's, it's very plain, and my voice probably sounds a bit weird in here, but we're just going to have to live with it, everyone. The core of the issue is that climate change is real, and that sucks. And that's really an understatement, right? But it is essentially that. It sucks. I hate it. You probably hate it too. And the thing is, this acknowledgement that it's a problem isn't confined to, you know, people wearing rum ham shirts on YouTube.com. There are even centrists who manage to wrap their head around the idea that climate change is real, which is impressive given how much they try not to notice things that are real and they don't really get around to actually, you know, understanding the causation or how you actually could mitigate the worst of it, but, you know, they at least observed the real world for once. Climate change is doing a few things to the planet that no one of any particular political persuasion can just wish away, even if eco-fascists sometimes hold what are essentially denialist positions by placing the blame for the issue in the wrong place, but we'll cover that in a bit. In the global north, this has different impacts and exerts different pressures as compared to the rest of the world, so our reactions are a bit different given how we've never really dealt with the fascists in our society at the opportune time to do that. Take an example. As the impact of climate change through an increased average temperature takes hold, we'll begin suffering from more extreme weather events. Now I can feel it. I can feel it now. You've heard me say the word weather. And you're going to go, aha, got you. It's summer. It's just summer, you dumbass. No, you're wrong. It's not just summer. And the spectacle of people seeing the hunger stones, which as you can probably tell, are living kind of rent free in my head, and going, so this has happened before then, as if it was some sort of gotcha, was a little tiny bit unedifying to say the least. 
The fact is that weather is becoming more extreme in the global north. I'm recording this in November, and we've only just now reached the weather where it's viable for me to wear a leather jacket outdoors. Without being horribly uncomfortable, that is. This extreme weather means that we have to change our societies to adapt to it. Britain, for example, wasn't built with regular large-scale storms or temperatures above 32 degrees consistently for weeks on end in mind, so our infrastructure will take a beating from it. Flooding will become more common as the extremes become more extreme. Drought will become more common. Our crops aren't necessarily going to produce the yields we're used to, never mind the fact that a lot of our food comes from elsewhere and they're suffering these problems in a more acute and immediate fashion. You will notice that I focused on impacts in the global north and the issues they'll face. That's because when it comes to climate change, a lot of the power to deal with the issue of climate change and indeed the responsibility given historic emissions and current per person consumption rates lies with them and the eco-fascist movements and attitudes that we're most likely to encounter given that i understand the audience demographics and youtube tells me who you are are likely to be located in the global north so i do want to take a moment to point out that climate change does not impact and will not impact places evenly the global north will get it relatively easy for a lot of reasons that's why it will be where people migrate to rather than migrate from, mostly generally. These uneven impacts are basically covered by lots of different people who are much more able than I am, and really it would deserve its own video, but I do have one example I want to think about. Take Iraq in the summer just gone. You'll all think of that summer if you're in Western Europe as especially unbearable and hot with temperatures going above 40 degrees, which is insane to be clear. But when I tell you Iraq had temperatures at or above 50 degrees, then you might not feel so bad about that. Now 50 degrees is, to put it mildly, essentially unbearable and unlivable, and not a temperature that any society has or can easily adapt to. Let me tell you an anecdote in case you've never been in temperatures like this without air conditioning. My grandmother, God bless her, chooses to return to her home village in the summer because it's, you know, a bit cooler, she can get out and about more easily, also, her favourite cats are there, all of them are descendants of her original cat, which implies some kind of CK freestyle Habsburg eugenics factory with the cats there. But anyway, me and my family, we had to use the air conless apartment as a sort of base when we were visiting Istanbul. In fact, this may have been the last time I did visit, now I think about it. And we were attending my cousin's wedding. Now the wedding was very fun, reception was in the evening, I got very drunk, it was great. What wasn't great was that the wedding was happening during a heat wave in Istanbul, in August. For those of you who don't know, Istanbul is not exactly like a cool place in the summer generally, but a heat wave in a place that's already not cool in August is pretty fucking bad. The day leading up to the reception was possibly one of the least comfortable experiences I've ever had, especially due to the insistence that everyone wear suits, which was insane to me at the time. But there we go, it sucked. That level of heat is unbearable. No matter how funny the spectacle of your cousin screaming at her brand new husband after trying to go drink for drink with her 19 year old dipshit cousin might be, uh, if she's watching this. Sorry, by the way, about the Jaeger bombs. Few days at above 50 degrees is unbearable, but the implication of that is that they're having days in the 40s just normally, very cool and normally. Now, one response to that migration is likely to be potentially seasonal, but more likely permanent as time goes on. Let's look at a map of Iraq and see who it neighbors. We've got Syria, Jordan, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Iran. Not exactly countries that are gonna be immune to a lot of the impending heat. So we're left with Turkey, and Turkey has an interesting role in migration and refugees and really is Europe's border guard. I remember way back in the halcyon days of David Cameron being Prime Minister and actually attempting to become Prime Minister in the 2000s that whenever he'd talk about Turkey and its presumably now long dead attempts to join the EU, he'd refer to it as Europe's flank and in these rather military terms. Now that was at the time in reference to Turkey's historic border with the Soviet Union and EU membership was seen as a worthy reward for Turkey's efforts, mostly military coups and vicious anti-communism, but you know, 
a NATO country, what do you expect? Now, Turkey has once again assumed that role, but this time is, as I said, a border guard. We'll talk more about Turkey's role in Fortress Europe later on, but suffice to say that the options for Iraqis, and indeed anyone else looking to take the Turkish route to escape climate-induced catastrophe, are not good. Left-wing and liberal responses towards climate change are reasonably well known. It is, after all, an issue that is most commonly associated with those particular positions on the political spectrum. Not that I believe in spectrums, but there we are. And the problems I mentioned above will probably not be news to you if you're anyone of the left, and I expect the majority of the viewers here to be. You are probably aware of the generalized need for adaptation to new weather conditions created by climate change and the need to prevent as much atmospheric CO2 from happening as possible. The thing is, about those problems I mentioned earlier, you can't really ignore them. Like, there's a physical reality, right? I mean, you can, in a literal sense, pretend these things are not happening, but when people are confronting you with flooded houses, or mass movements of people, or crop failures, or, again, and I just want to be clear that this is what they are actually called, hunger stones, then even obstinate right-wingers who are invested in extractive capitalism have to try and work out, you know, how do I fix this, right? For a while, this position was one of, well, yes, the climate is changing, but it's sunspots or natural processes. Nothing to be done on our part. Oh, well, which of course is half correct in that the climate is changing, but it had very little to do with either of the processes that were described. Then they moved on to, well, maybe it is driven by human activity, but we'll find the one weird trick or advance down the right bit of the tech tree and we'll be able to fix it because capitalism drives innovation and solves problems at the last second, which, if that sounds remarkably like what this ham dipshit was saying about carbon capture a few days before recording or release, uh, yeah, there's a reason why it sounded like that. And if we're thinking about this argument that capitalism drives innovation and going down the right bit of the tech tree will solve the problem, uh, not really, no. But on the plus side, we might try some geoengineering, so that'll be fun, we'll get to see how we fuck that up. We're now in a position where what's said by these people tends to amount to, yes, it's happening, but oops, it's too late. So we're gonna write off whole parts of the world and try to keep our living standards as high as possible. Sorry, when they're, in fact, it will shock you to know, not sorry. To put it bluntly, right-wing attempts to address climate change basically make them sound like dickheads. Because they are dickheads. But that's more, different video, different video for that. There's a long, history of the right wing, and indeed fascists themselves, forming arrangements with or just straight up co-opting green politics. In Austria, the Green Party there formed a coalition with the People's Party, led at the time by Sebastian Kurz, who, before I even tell you anything about him, you can tell exactly what his politics are by the fact that he looks like an amalgamation of every single person under 30, who believes their freedom of speech is being impeded because they can't talk about the real problem. This coalition pursued hardened policies against migrants and went on to do not very much about the environment domestically. In fact, Sebastian Kurz famously said he wanted to protect young girls from immigration with a headscarf ban, and then said controlling illegal immigration is as important as tackling climate change now, as we'll see a bit later on. There's a reason these two issues are being linked, but... There it is, that's what the uh, Green Party of Austria were propping up for a while. Now, this all tracks very closely to what we're gonna learn, but it also shows a vulnerability in green politics that's rooted in just vagaries and nice things that they tend to be rooted in rather than the cold, hard, and to be honest, quite difficult material realities of the challenge in front of us. You'll be surprised by how similar a lot of your, you know, lovely, friendly, neighbourhood environmentalists sound to weird, bat-born freaks like Kurtz, or indeed dipshits like Nick Griffin, whose BNP also liked to cloak itself in environmentalism as part of a fascist, green and pleasant land type argument, as well as some things later that we'll kind of see amount to Malthusianism. So we have a background to the problem, and the fact that everyone is actually having to react to a problem as it exists, or at least to the consequences of it as they exist. But what makes an eco-fascist? Well, for that, we're going to go to the bar. Okay, I don't really have a bar, everyone. Don't 
Don't flame me in the comments saying it's not a bar. I know it's not a bar, it's my kitchen. But let's have some fun, make a cocktail to numb the pain of learning. And, you know, hopefully it'll taste good. I've not, this is well, well, well before I've made it and tested out the drink. So let's find out. The ingredients. Welcome to my kitchen. This is the gimmick bit of the video, but I promise it'll be fine. You'll love it. If alcohol isn't your thing, don't worry. In this analogy, that means that you're basically fine. But let's make a cocktail together and let's call it eco-fascism and see whether I can make a drink that actually looks green, but will also ruin your life. I've got my bottles here. They are looking at me very judgmentally because I've already had a test version of this drink. And let me tell you, yeah, it'll probably do that. So, traditionally for making cocktails, uh, you're really meant to go from like the cheapest ingredient to the most expensive, but that doesn't really work narratively, and this is a narrative experience apparently now. I don't know when that started on this channel. So, before anyone goes, oh, you didn't do it right. I know, I know I didn't do it right. I'm not gonna do it right. Just, just be at peace with it, okay? All right, first things first. Let's get our mixer, the mixer. That was uncomfortably difficult, but anyway. First, we need to get our sourness into the drink. And I need to wash this, I'll be right back. Okay, having freshly washed this, we can now measure out uh, the juice of half a lime. That's what we want, the juice of half a lime for this. It could probably have a bit more, I guess, but half a lime seemed to work well in the test version. So that's what we're gonna go for. Let's. Uh, Squeeze it in. Oh boy. Difficult lime. Okay, that, this was a bigger half apparently. Apparently I can't cut limes very well. But uh yeah, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to live with that as it is. So in case anyone's wondering, this is what the lime crusher looked like. Wow, I have had a drink, definitely. Uh so yeah, this is our lime juice. Gonna be very important. And the lime juice is gonna represent uh, sourness and on its own the juice of a lime is sour nasty you know it's not very nice it's not very pleasant I don't know I find limes quite pleasant but some people do not like drinking straight lime juice nor am I intending to do that on camera now this is something that's leaking more and more into general discourse and it's something called Malthusianism before I get into the substance of the idea I just want to point out that these ideas originate in the thoughts of a person called Thomas Robert Malthus, who looks like this. Uh, yeah, look, you can probably tell that this is going to get very normal very quickly. Malthus asked not an entirely unreasonable question on the surface, right? What happens if the population grows faster than our capacity to feed people? And that's not an unfair question to ask necessarily, right? But the way Malthus thought of population growth in relation to our capacity to feed people was that the capacity to feed people would grow more slowly than the population could grow and would grow. Now, if you're watching this in 2022, you might notice that that didn't happen. We are not living through a Malthusian catastrophe. We do, in fact, have enough capacity to feed everyone on Earth. So why are this guy's ideas still kicking around in supposedly environmentalist movements? Well, as a general rule, as economies grow, they tend to emit more CO2 per person, at least if we're looking at how the global north developed, which leads people to this series of bad thoughts. If countries are growing economically in the global south, their per person CO2 will go up, their consumption will go up, and their populations are still growing rapidly, so we can't afford for them to do these things. Now, there are a number of flaws here, but let's talk about the two obvious ones. One is that if you look at per person CO2, the global north is still leading the way, even when you account for all of the stuff that we've just offshored onto the global south so that we can enjoy the cheap things, which are... Uh, yeah, don't look too hard at who our supply lines uh, are reliant on and which specific country that is, because that's going to lead to a whole other incredibly grim conversation. The other issue is that we're talking about climate change, right? And that's a cumulative issue. 
That is that the issues we face today are caused by historic CO2 emissions, which even accounting for China's emergence as an industrial powerhouse means that it's mostly caused by, you guessed it, the global north. Which makes it all the more curious that this sort of thought has any traction in an environmentalist movement, because to me, from observation, this looks like advocacy for at best some kind of imposed forced birth control on the global south, which is definitely going into dicey territory, and at worst can just move into advocacy for plain old genocide, just, just saying the quiet part loud. The next step in our cocktail is to add the stuff that will actually result in the deaths in practical terms. Now, to be clear, this drink will not kill you unless you're allergic to alcohol, in which case it will kill you. Do not drink alcohol if you're allergic to it. And also, you know, just don't drink it at all, personally, but, you know, that ship sailed for me already tonight and in my life. But we're going to talk about the thing that's actually really going to get people. And that is going to be represented by a double of vodka. Now, I, I happen to have Polish vodka here. You can uh, you can check it out. Uh, it was it was thirteen pounds forty nine at the off license. I bought it some time ago, but you know, I've never been able to use it all on my cocktail streams, which you can catch at twitch.tv slash Crusade. They're a very occasional treat for streams where I make cocktails. You know what? I'll do the whole I'll do that lovely pour for you all. And that is what's really gonna kick this into the next gear. So this really represents about 10 or 11 different things, but I really want to focus on three. Authoritarianism, which, you know, I feel like I don't have to get too deep into. You probably conceptually understand what authoritarianism, you probably conceptually understand what authoritarianism is. Imperialism, particularly green imperialism, which will come in the form of our consumption habits changing, though not necessarily lessening and anti-refugee politics, which links up with our sourness in this cocktail quite nicely, as the vodka does with lemon juice, um, lime juice, and lemon juice, to be fair. It, like, it, it, it mixes quite nicely with both. That's how Vodka Collinses get made. But it links up quite nicely with our sourness, because Malthusianism, as expressed by eco-fascists, tends to mean that we're writing off places refugees are coming from, and we harden our borders to stop them from coming here. An example cropped up during the editing process for this script, and this is from the most embarrassing product of my school and the baldest dickhead ever produced by the town of Reading, which I have to say is a, is a special achievement. Well done for being the baldest guy produced by the town of Reading, Matthew Syed. And the headline here is, Limiting refugee numbers is not illiberal, it's vital to our survival. Isn't that great? Is that great? Is that, what, what could possibly be wrong with that? Um, now, I just want to reply directly to Matthew Side right now. Shut the fuck up, you bald dickhead. This is just liberal repackaging of Suella Braverman's invasion rhetoric, which any reasonable person would recognize as fascist. So just shut the fuck up, you useless prat. Anyway. Then I want to add a tiny bit of something that became apparent as I was reading about this. All of this is deeply, deeply pessimistic. And so, for colour purposes later, because uh, we're adding it now for the sake of the bit, but for colour purposes, really, I want to add a little bit of the pessimism with blue curacao. Now, I know this doesn't exactly look like a pessimistic drink because it's bright blue and it's lovely and ooh, it looks really nice. Actually, this is quite a nice blue curacao. Uh, but it's it's for colour purposes, you'll hopefully see it on camera later because uh, things do not come out well in this light because I don't have like a specific lighting setup but we're gonna add a little bit of blue curacao to represent this pessimism that laces all of it, really brings it all together. God that drink is looking obnoxiously blue, this has gone in the wrong direction so far. But then we come to the good stuff, the things that will make this palatable both visually and in terms of flavor. So right now, this is a pretty noxious, undrinkable mess. You can't see it, and I'm not gonna angle this enough for you to see it, but it's, uh, 
yeah, it's not great. It's not great. Let's just leave it there. So now what I want to do is add a little something special to this. I want to add some Midori. Midori is this melon liqueur from Japan. Uh, and it is really nice. I like adding it to lots of stuff. But what it's going to do is it's going to be a green element to all of this. Yeah, I'm being real basic with it. So this will represent, and you can see it on camera, it is really green. It is a really green drink. And this will represent our cloaking of these things in green politics. Because for a lot of us on the left, or just in general, being green politically, it's kind of a soft, fluffy thing that's not an inherent bad. Yeah, there are bad green politicians, but we want, or should want, to deal with climate change fairly. And that shouldn't be incompatible with, you know, this lovely green that this is now looking like, right? So you can think of the Midori as kind of like a Trojan horse that we're hiding, and also the green politics that people hide behind. as a sort of Trojan horse that we're hiding all of this horrible stuff in. Uh, it looks great, by the way. And before we shake it, uh, I'm going to add a little bit of simple syrup. Simple syrup, by the way, for anyone wondering, is uh, I make it one part water to one part sugar uh, by volume. It is just, it is, and you just boil it until it's all dissolved. Well, you don't even boil it. You just heat it up until it's all dissolved, and that's it. That's your simple syrup. And this is, you know, I like, I like my drink sweet, so I'm going to add quite a bit of it. You can add it to your taste. Uh, I'm going to be a big boy and add a lot of simple syrup to this because I'm a, I'm a baby, basically. I'm a baby. I like my drink sweet. So we're, we're going to add it, right? And this is going to represent the biggest lie of ecofascism and the thing that makes ecofascism most palatable to people, which is the idea that the way we live now with our cocktail shakers and our Midori and all of this other stuff and iPhone, Vuvuzela, etc., etc., right? The way that we live now can just carry on in the global north. The party can carry on forever. It's like that bit in Always Sunny where the bar is slowly running out of stuff and it's flooding in one part and eventually it goes wrong. But the promise of ecofascism is that it will never go wrong. The party can carry on forever. And to be honest with you, that's not true. And we shouldn't act like that. But for the purposes of the bit now, I'm going to add some ice to this, which is going to represent, look, it's really basic, but it's going to represent the, uh, the ice caps or anything. It was, the, it was the smartest thing I could come up with as I was writing the script. And I'm going to shake it. I'm going to pour it out into a nice glass. And we're going to... We're gonna add. We're gonna have some ice in the glass, and then we're gonna do a little something. All right, everyone. Little's finest ice for you. Little's finest ice. All right. Let's. Uh, and also, let's get our glass out. Now, I put the glass in the freezer for a specific purpose, which is that it will look like this. It's quite a fancy little trick. It's quite nice, actually. It's really. Nice. Let's leave that there. Let's shake up the drink. And also, we're going to put some ice in our glass real quick. Again, Little's Finest. Again, Little's Finest into the glass. Great. And we're going to shake up. Looks great. Then we pour it into our lovely glass. Which, uh, yeah, it's very cloudy. As if to obscure the horror contained within. That does look really nice, though. I don't know if the camera is catching how nice that looks. Hold on, I might need to play around with my lights so that you can see how just how nice this actually looks. Hold on. It's working. Yeah, there you go, everyone. Hold on, let me. There you go, everyone. Yeah, this is kind of deep greenish, kind of brightish deep green, deep sea green. I guess it looks great. Uh, yeah, I didn't have a particularly nice glass for this, so yeah, that's more or less that. And then we're going to top it off, just to make it extra palatable, with a bit of Sprite. Now, uh, I use Sprite, you can use any lemon-lime soft drink that you like, but I happen to live near an American store where they have... But I happen to have, like, actual Sprite that doesn't have any, like, sweeteners in it, so I'm going to use that for this. And we're going to pour it over our drink. We've got to be a bit careful because it's going to want to, want to overflow. Obviously because I'm pouring stuff into it. 
And there you go. We have a lovely busy delight for us. And we have our cocktail, and I'm going to use my metal straw, if I can find where it is, which is right here. And we're going uh, to have a taste. Cheers, everyone. <laughs> Did not want to be drunk, apparently. Oh, yeah. That's nice. Hardly taste the alcohol, which I suppose is the point. But the thing about how good this tastes and how palatable it is and look at how pretty etc etc is that that's the danger of it right we've been doing the political equivalent of drinking too many of these on the beach and that's already had some consequences we're already drunk all right welcome back to my bedroom uh, i don't know if this is a better lighting for this drink or not but yeah there you go enjoy looking at the drink i'm gonna be drinking this as we do this bit I could finally sit down and enjoy it. I was very careful to make sure the straw didn't escape me that time. So what does so what does this drink, or the policies represented by the drink, manifest itself as? Well, lucky for us, we already have a few examples of how it can manifest. Because as I said, we've been slamming these like there's no tomorrow. And to be honest, if we keep doing that, there might not be. Let's start with something every British government in my adult life has been trying to do. Reduce or change the nature of aid given to the global south. Now this feeds into a couple of different things. The obvious one is the classic British. Why are we sending them money when we could be taking care of our own? And like, you know, almost always it comes from someone who, when they're offered a set of choices that means that we could take care of our own, they just turn their heads away like a baby refusing to eat food. It also might remind us of one of the things about Malthusianism and what that leads to, a writing off of countries outside of the global north. Another example would be something that we could call green imperialism. Some of you will be familiar with the country of Bolivia, the country underwent a Christo-fascist coup that was rather interestingly cheered on by various people who tend to self-identify as liberals. And then for a series of protests and popular pressure, they had elections, the coup government was ousted, and then Luis Arce, Arce? Pronunciation is hard, okay? I don't, I, I don't know, pronunciation's hard. Became president and he was from the party of the deposed president, Evo Morales. Why am I telling you this story? Well, Bolivia had some of the world's richest lithium deposits. Now, lithium is, in general, quite a cool element. There are lots of cool experiments you can do with lithium. Uh, by the way, do not put lithium into water under any circumstances. And I don't want to flex my science nerd credentials too hard, but it's an essential component to things like batteries, which are a key part of market-driven decarbonization. And it turns out that the coup government may have been more than a little willing to give favorable terms or what in the old days we would call unequal treaties to the global north and their companies all of that access to that sweet sweet lithium i mean just check out this tweet from the guy who now owns twitter.com and is hopefully about to kill it where he says we will coup whoever we want deal with it and well they did deal with it by ousting the coup government so how do you like that you bald apartheid emerald prick Another thing this delicious, delicious drink can lead to is an increase in authoritarianism. Just to prove it isn't actually going to kill you. We can see it in the UK, with climate protests specifically being cited as the catalyst for more draconian anti-protest laws, where a woman who's credibly a security risk herself has decided to give herself a bunch of new anti-protest powers this woman's nickname by the way is leaky sue if you're wondering how like much of a security risk she clearly is though this should be seen as part of a much longer trend starting much earlier it's not a surprise that it's hardening as climate issues become more salient remember that nasty heat wave we had earlier in the uk this year yeah that may have lit a metaphorical for now fire under a lot of people's ass we're also seeing some natural consequences of consuming eco-fascism in the form of targeted anti-immigration and general anti-refugee policy. I'm glad that I delayed writing the script so that I could at least include some of the latest insane shit people are spouting about refugees, with Albanians now the specific focus of people's ire. 
I've no real idea why. I guess these people just spin a wheel and pick whoever it lands on. But we're also seeing it from Damp Ham and leader of the opposition, Keith Starmer, who's talking about reducing immigration in certain areas because... I don't know, fuck you, I guess? And this hardening of borders is entirely consistent with the politics being described in this video. Keith will come to the electorate, presumably in 2024, but who the fuck knows in the UK, right? And claim that he wants a greener, fairer future. That was literally the slogan of the party at his conference, I think. While pushing this hardening border regime. And the thing is, it'll click with a lot of people and for a lot of people because they're already loaded up on eco-fascism. That was not smooth, I should have practiced drinking before. Let's take some examples of hardening and militarizing borders and let's contrast it with an idea that I think is incorrect. As we've established, climate change will likely lead to mass migrations of people because to use the Iraq example again, 50 degrees is not tolerable or livable. And then let's return to this idea of Fortress Europe for a minute. The EU is famed for its internal freedom of movement. If you're a citizen of one member state, you get to move to wherever you like in the EU and, you know, work and do whatever. I mean, who likes to work? But you get the idea. And that's pretty nice, right? But what if you're trying to get into the EU and you're not from a member state? Let's say you were fleeing from Libya, the site of one of the more famous interventions of recent years where there weren't slave markets before but there are slave markets now or at least there were after the intervention now if you're going to chance it on a boat and try to reach italy or i guess malta but i suspect it's hard to aim for malta it's kind of small well the eu will actively try to prevent you from making landfall because if you land in the eu you're their problem suddenly so they engage in an illegal practice, by the way, it's an illegal practice called pushbacks. Or their border agency will often allow refugees in damaged ships to drown. Uh, this is the same if you decide to find yourself in a Turkish refugee camp and you find that unbearable. Because the best that will happen for you is that you'll be used as geopolitical blackmail by a man who's so thin-skinned he sues people for calling him Gollum in a meme. And yep, yeah, that's... That's real, by the way. That's a real thing that that guy did. Or let's take a look at Trump's border wall. Now that turned out to be more of a fence than a concrete wall of people's imagination, which is just as well, because I don't think there's enough concrete in the world that's made to build a wall in the way that he imagined it. But his big, beautiful southern border wall, and yes, that is a verbatim quote, is interesting. Why put it on the border with Mexico, not Canada? Yeah, the obvious answer is that Trump is a racist rodeo clown, but that is also where a lot of migration comes from for the US, and that's not a situation that's likely to calm down as climate change takes hold. Now, Trump didn't necessarily do this for eco-fascist reasons, more than fascist reasons, because he thinks climate change is a hoax made up by the Chinese or whatever the fuck goes on in his head. But it'll be interesting to see in coming years whether that hardening border situation changes significantly. I mean, after all, there are still kids in cages under Biden. Or we could take Japan's notoriously hard border regime or Australia's use of Pacific Islands as prison camps. There's honestly a whole host of examples of global North countries hardening their borders that we can pluck out of the air. But I want to ask you this. Does this sound like the Global North isn't preparing for climate change? Or does it sound like we are in fact preparing, but are going about it in an insanely stupid and destructive way? We clearly are preparing for climate change, or at least the consequences of it, which is bad news because consequences are symptoms, not causes. And treating symptoms means we're already killing people, either by drowning them in the seas around Fortress Europe, or by writing off any prospect of aiding countries in the global south as crop failures take hold due to climate change, or by casually internalizing the idea that overpopulation is the cause of the problem, which it's not. The thing is, as I pointed out in an earlier video, which didn't get nearly enough love, so I'm shamelessly plugging it now. Go check it out after I'm done with this one. There are solutions to the crisis of climate change, and we know how to deal with the problem. It's just that these solutions threaten systems, 
and class privilege, so instead we're treated to this palatable concoction that's oh so easy to drink and the ice is mostly melted, and will almost certainly give us the mother of all hangovers, though hopefully not. I've got work the day after I'm shooting this bit, so no hangover. Hmm. It's gonna give me a hangover though. Concluding thoughts. My main concluding thought is one of, it's kind of a sadness thing, right? Sadness that so much general political effort is diverted into policies that won't actually solve the problem and are empowering people and movements that won't just like dick us over, because dicking us over is one thing, but they'll also allow the rampant destruction of our environment to continue and the question is, is there a solution to the problem? Well, remember, it's eco-fascism, right? And that fascism bit's important because there are definitely ways to deal with fascists that are well-worn, but to keep the metaphor of the video being about a cocktail, which I have now drunk, so, well, you know, easy come, easy go, I guess. The solution is to just not drink it or find a version that doesn't have alcohol in it. I'm kind of losing track of the idea because I've already had a couple of these to test them. Test them, you know, just make sure they were good. I wanted to make sure for you. Uh, the recipe, by the way, will be in the description down below. But in all seriousness, it's important that we not misunderstand the lack of action on the issues we know relate to climate change, like rapid decarbonization or technology sharing with the global south, or rewilding, or whatever your particular thoughts or series of thoughts is on what is to be done about climate change, and mistake that for not being prepared in some fashion for it or its consequences. We are being prepared for it. And the way it's happening is, as always, insidious and laced with fascism, because the sad truth is, the fascists never went away in Europe and were reaping what was sowed by that failure at the time, right as it might fuck all of us. Anyway, let's leave it here for now. I'm gonna go drink some water because I've probably had about three of these. And to be honest, I have to get up for work tomorrow. I have a daily meeting at eight. So, you know, gotta go do that. I just wanna thank my good friend, Mick Wright, who proofread the script, and also my partner who also proofread the script. Uh, you can find all the mixed stuff down below. I also wanna thank my patrons who are very special and really really give me the motivation to keep making these sorry it's been such a while since the last one i am going to try in the new year to stick to a more stable schedule it's just that i've not found a decent time to record but i want to give a special shout out to drone riff Makujio, and kazi shida those are the top tier subscribers if you want a shout out you've got to hit up the patreon if you want access to the discord that's also a pretty good way to get into it otherwise you can find all of my stuff in the description down below and i will catch you next time see you folks